Welcome again to the Buckingham Center for Facial Plastic Surgery video tutorial series. This evening I'm going to try and tackle the topic of facial fillers, which is a really broad topic, so you have to bear with me as I kind of go through this. First we're going to talk about the different types of fillers, and then we're going to talk about the uses of those fillers, and we'll try and define which fillers are better for which locations. So firstly, what are the types of facial fillers? And this is a question we'll have to answer in the context of what is currently FDA approved in the United States because there are a lot of different fillers that are used outside of the United States that eventually may gain approval here. And actually, I probably will leave out some fillers that are available in the United States just because there are certain ones that I don't really feel fill a niche outside of what we already use other fillers for. And so um, I may not mention some of those. So the main filler classes are hyaluronic acid fillers, which consist of Juvederm, Juvederm Ultra, Restylane, and Perlane. And there may be some other hyaluronic acid ones out there. There was Hyaliform and Keptique, and I think some, maybe some of those are still around out there, but they're not commonly used. Um, there are also Porcine, which is pig collagen fillers out there. And I believe the most common one is um, called Evolence, and it's uh, another filler that's available. You may have heard about it. You may see ads about it. Um, I personally don't see a role for that in conjunction with what the hyaluronic acid fillers do, and so we haven't really used that filler. Um, there's also the calcium hydroxyl appetite class, of which the one that's approved in the United States is, is referred to as RADIES. And there was a permanent filler on the market in the United States referred to as Artifil. Um, the company that held that went bankrupt. It's now been re-released by a new company. Um, it is a permanent filler that consists of bovine or cow collagen mixed with uh, polymethylmethacrylate beads, which is a permanent filler. And then there's silicone, liquid silicone, which is FDA approved for ophthalmologic use and some physicians are using it as a permanent filler. It is not something that I recommend. I think that if it is done properly, you can get benefit that is safe from it. The problem with it is that it can persist or will persist for years, but can persist in growing collagen around it for years and may end up with results 20 years down the road that are not what was intended at all. And so therefore, we do not do liquid silicone in our office and I don't particularly advocate its use. So let's talk a little bit more about those fillers and those classes. So hyaluronic acid fillers are, are a big, mucopolysaccharide molecule, so basically a big sugar molecule. It's a naturally produced substance in the body. It's present in skin, it's present in joint fluid, it's present in the, in the vitreous of the eye, and so it has basically been taken as that molecule and produced in a test tube, and the ones that we most commonly use, Juvederm and Restylane and Perlane, are produced through a process of bacterial fermentation to produce the molecule, which then undergoes a cross-linking process. If you just take the native hyaluronic acid molecule as it is in the body and inject it, it only has a longevity of a day or two. And so these products are cross-linked through a molecular process so that the molecules become bigger, are harder to break down, and therefore last longer. So in general, the hyaluronic acid molecules, when injected, last somewhere between six months to a year or slightly longer, depending upon where you inject them. The more mobile part of the face that you inject them into, the least longevity they have, the more stable the area you inject them, the longer longevity they have. So the lips are the shortest longevity, and under the eyes or in the glabella or frown line area tend to be the longest area of longevity. So somewhere between six months and a year, and the most average is probably about nine months for the hyaluronic acid fillers. For the calcium hydroxyl appetite fillers, this is, again, that molecule. It's calcium hydroxyl appetite. Um, the most common one is radius, and what that molecule is, is it's a molecule that is the precursor to what forms bone in the body. It needs to undergo another chemical process to make bone, and so when you inject it in the soft tissues, you're not going to get bone out of it, um, but when produced in the test tube, it forms a nice pasty material that has good longevity, good feel, good support, but eventually, again, is broken down by the body into calcium and phosphate molecules, which are naturally occurring in the body and can't harm you in any way. Um, and so it resorbs over time. So again, it's not a permanent filler, it's a semi-permanent filler. And 
may produce some collagen production after injection in the body that may be a permanent benefit to that, although it won't give you the same degree of correction as the filler when it's in place will do. Then Artifil, as I alluded to earlier, is a permanent filler made up of a polymethyl methacrylate bead. It's a permanent bead once it's injected, the body forms collagen around it, and so you can get some permanent correction from it. I don't know what its longevity will be in the United States again. We have injected it in, it, in individuals and we may inject it in the future. It's been used in Canada for years and years and years and has been deemed to be a safe product there. So you may see it gain some market share in the, in the United States. You might not. Its usefulness is limited to the nasolabial folds and marionette lines in my opinion. I wouldn't use it for larger volume augmentation, which we'll go into a little bit more. Certainly is not used in the lips, um, in my opinion, should not be used there. Um, and I would be very reticent to use it in the upper parts of the face as well. So let's talk a little bit about where these fillers are used. Now, these fillers are mostly FDA approved for use in facial lines and folds and wrinkles in the perioral area. So some of the things we're going to talk to you about are off-label uses. So the FDA hasn't specifically approved them for that use. But in the United States, if something is approved by the FDA, the uses can be expanded into other areas and it's perfectly acceptable to do this. So the most common area that these fillers are used for is the nasolabial folds or smile lines and the marionette lines or puppet lines. And I'm going to talk about now just the hyaluronic acid fillers and the calcium hydroxyl appetite fillers, so uh, Restylane, Juvederm, and Perlane radius. Um, we're not going to talk about Artifil anymore. So any of those fillers can be used in the smile lines or the marionette lines to augment and fill those out, reduce the prominence of those folds, and therefore produce a more youthful appearance. Um, in the area of the upper marionette line, injecting into this area in the corner of the mouth can also reduce that downturned corner of the mouth and turn that corner of the mouth to a more flat, neutral position, which is a much more youthful position. The, probably the third most common area that these fillers are used for is for lip augmentation. Now, radius, in my opinion, again, is not good for lip augmentation. The only fillers that we'll use in the lips are Restylane, Perlane, and Juvederm. I think they're basically interchangeable. If you start really um, cracking down and comparing them, the Juvederm probably has a little softer feel in the lips. Um, the Restylane's probably a little firmer feel in the lips, and it's really a matter of personal preference. If you like that little bit more of a firm feel, then Restylane's uh, the filler we use. If you like a softer feel than Juvederm, the longevity is the same. In order to do this injection, especially in the lips, we'll do a complete block of the perioral area with lidocaine. So we'll come up underneath the lips, put a little injection in the nerves that come out to serve the upper lip, down below to serve the lower lip, and then we'll also augment that with some lidocaine around the lip so it's completely numb. Um, therefore, that injection in that area isn't painful. Now, lip injections can be used for a couple different things. People sometimes come in and they just don't like the little fine lines as they come into the lips. So we can do just a little bit of augmentation along just that lip border just to fill in those fine lines. Other people are looking for just a true lip augmentation. So we'll put uh, some filler into the border of the lip as well as into the body of the lip and really augment that whole thing. Now, somebody who has really thin lips can't hope to have natural appearing very big lips. It is somewhere where you can take somebody with thin lips and make them moderate in size. You can take somebody with moderate lips and make them larger in size. But our goals are to not create that fish mouth or duck bill looking lips that are very artificial that unfortunately you see uh, walking around. So we really want to produce natural results. I'm not going to take this stuff and, and use it and, and make an unnatural result. Now, when we're doing other areas like the smile lines and the marionette lines, we may do a little bit of some nerve blocking, but what we'll do is we'll mix lidocaine in with the fillers, and therefore as we progress, the area becomes more and more numb, and so it becomes a very comfortable injection as we progress. So that's the main uses for the perioral area. Now as we progress down a little bit, um, we have this area called the pre-jowl sulcus, which is an area just in front of the jowl, which is what you see descend in patients who have lost the contour of their jawline. So, People who are trying to avoid a facelift or people who need a facelift but have a problem with the pre-jowl and are not interested in a surgical correction for that area, we can inject a filler into that area, improve and hide that jowling a little bit. And once again, you can use any of the fillers. I'd prefer to use some of the thicker fillers in that area, so either Radius, Juvederm, Ultra Plus, or Perlane would be my choice there. The, the calcium hydroxyl appetite fillers or Radius tend to last a little longer. They tend to have about a 12 to 18 month longevity, which is a little bit longer than the hyaluronic acids. 
um, and they're very good for deep filling injections, so uh, radius is another great filler for that area. Progressing up from the perioral area, we use fillers to do things like fill in the tear trough under the eye and augment the cheek, as well as fill in lines in the glabella that are the static lines, which if you watch our Botox video, we define the lines that are dynamic or that are when the muscles are contracting, and then those lines that have become etched in and are now static. So fillers work very good for that glabellar area, and again, you can use radius, perlane, any of the hyaluronic acid fillers for that area. For the area of cheek augmentation, I preferentially will use radius. I think radius is a great filler to be placed deep into the subcutaneous tissue. I think sometimes the hyaluronic acid fillers lose their longevity when placed in this deep tissue plane. Radius doesn't do that. So to augment the cheek and fill in general facial volume loss with a syringe, I would use radius. Now, as we progress into the thinner skin under the eye, I'm not a big fan of radius there. I think that it has a, a more firm feel in that area. I know there's lots of physicians that use it there. I prefer to use the hyaluronic acid fillers into the area under the eyes and in this tear trough area to fill in and take care of that tired double contour related to the eyelid. Now, again, that gets into another topic that you know, explains what the double contour is and how the eyelid contours are. Um, we have another video on our series referred, uh, called Fat Transfer. That talks a lot about eyelid contour, so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can refer to that. Or if you go to the website um, and look at the eyelid or fat transfer rejuvenation sections, you'll have a textual description of what I'm talking about there. But basically, it's filling in that hollow or tear trough um, under the eye. Now, you can talk about facial volume loss in general and using these fillers. And in our practice, you know, we tend to draw the line at some point where we say, look, you know, you're starting to talk about using so much filler you know, that you're getting into four and five and six syringes of this stuff, uh, which gets you into the several thousand dollar price tag, you know, two to three thousand dollars when you start getting into six syringes of this. So I really don't recommend using syringe-based fillers when we're really talking about doing pan facial rejuvenation as far as fillers are concerned. So once we get to that point, I start to talk about people about using autologous fat for a filler, which is a completely different procedure. It's a surgical procedure where we harvest fat from the body and use it as the filler to contour the eyes and cheeks and, and other areas of the face. And again, that's beyond the scope of this video, so please refer to our video library. You can find the, the video on fat transfer and you'll get more information as we progress from syringe-based fillers into higher volume facial rejuvenation procedures like fat transfer. So that is fillers in a nutshell. I hope it's been educational for you. I know it's a very confusing topic difficult to grasp all the different varieties of fillers. Um, again, I probably have not mentioned some fillers that are out there, but those are primarily the ones that we use in our practice. I think they're by far have the lion's share of the market in other practices as well, and they're very useful and have great utility towards providing facial rejuvenation.